Hello everyone this is part 1 of what if Naruto was the hollow god, and this story is made by Bad Boy 1992 and I hope you guys enjoy this video and to like, to subscribe, and check out the playlist, to see more comment down below, now let's start the, intro. Twelve, let's call them, beings, since they certainly are not humans, were standing in a place, which was completely white all around and above them. Unlike the sides and the ceiling of the place, the floor, seems to not even be there, as it looks like the twelve of them are standing on air. They are looking at something which was happening in the place called, Kanoa, in the land of fire. They are watching a small, blonde-haired, twelve, maybe thirteen-year-old kid. He was dressed in an old orange jumpsuit, which was torn up in many places, showing the kid's pale skin. Because of how damaged the jumpsuit is, the twelve beings could see how skinny and malnourished the boy is. They could also see that the boy has some scars and bruises all over his face, as well as his body. There was also dried up blood on his face and cloths, or at least what's left of the cloths, anyway. The boy is currently on his knees, on a high platform, in the middle of the village. His hands are tied behind his back, while his ankles are tied to the platform. He was looking down below, at the mass of people, who have gathered to watch his execution. He noticed that majority of the people had smirks, or large smiles on their faces, while only occasional few, wore scowls, angry faces, or were crying because of what's about to happen. The boy did his best to memorize the faces of the latter ones, as they are the ones who care about him, and he wants their faces to be the last thing he sees and thinks about before his imminent deaths. It took him a while to memorize all of their faces, probably because one of his eyes was shut from the swelling, which he got from the beating he was put through the last few days ever since he was thrown into prison. The fact that he also has a concussion from all the beating, didn't help with the memorizing. After he memorized the faces of his precious people, few as they might be, he looked around himself at those who were standing on the platform. He had trouble seeing them with just one eye, but he noticed that, all but one of them wore smirks on their faces, while the last one, the fifth hockage herself, had a blank look on her face. She looked neither happy nor sad, it was like she wasn't even there, mentally. One of the people who were on the stand, Naruto recognized him as one of the elders of the council, walked at the front of the execution platform, and started to explain, how Naruto is the village traitor, who almost killed the last Uchiha on the mission to retrieve the said Uchiha, from the clutches of the traitor, Orokimaru, who kidnapped Sasuke Uchiha from the village. He said that because of what Naruto did to Sasuke, causing him grave injuries, which could have been fatal if not for Sunid, Naruto was sentenced to death, and Sasuke himself will be the one to perform the execution. While the old man was giving the speech to the masses, the twelve beings above them were watching the scene with mostly blank looks. What is going on here? asked the smallest and the youngest looking member of the group. Her name is, Linet and she was wearing a helmet, with two horns on the top of her head. The left horn looks as if it has been cut off and the left half of the mask covers her left eye. Her right eye is light pink, with the left eye covered by her mask and a flame design over the eye socket and she also has light green hair arranged in a very basic manner. She was dressed in a white colored briefs with a black line positioned in the middle, arm warmers, a revealing vest with a high collar and thigh high, fur lined boots. The most interesting thing about her, is the hole, positioned in the center of her stomach. Who is that kid? And why are you showing us this? Her question was addressed at the tall female, wearing a regal clothing like that of a princess or a queen. She looks like she is in her early twenties. Has long, light brown hair and blue eyes, along with three blue marks on her face, one of which is in the middle of her forehead, while the other two are below and to the side of her eyes. The most noticeable thing about her, is her unearthly beauty and presence, which was felt by the other eleven beings. It didn't surprise them though, as she was a goddess, after all. Now that you see this kid, the goddess spoke. Doesn't he bring out some memories? There was a silence after that question, as all eleven beings, plus the goddess, were looking at Naruto, his face, to be more specific. Yes, said one of the beings, whose name is Alkiora. This one is a slender, yet fairly muscular, male of average height with a melancholic appearance. He has fairly short, messy black hair, pale white skin, a black upper lip, and green eyes with small slit-shaped pupils, similar to a cat's. Part of his bangs fall between his eyes, and he has distinctively thick eyebrows. 
He has teal lines which descend from the lower part of his eyes. He wears a white jacket, black sash, and a white hakama. His jacket though, has longer coattails than the others in the room, who also wear similar clothing. His collar is higher than the others have. The most noticeable thing, a hole on his throat. He does seem familiar for some reason, I just can't figure out why, since I'm sure I have never seen him before. Alkiora speaking the whole sentence was a surprise for the others, as he was very quiet and barely speaks, unless personally asked a question. They decided not to pay attention to that right now, because, just like Alkiora, they all seem to have memories of Naruto, and just like Alkiora, they can't figure out, why. I feel like I'm he and he is me, this came from a man named Sayeloporo. He is a tall and thin male. He has shoulder-length pink hair with bangs on the right side of his forehead, with two thin lines missing hair on the left side of his head and amber eyes. He has a rectangular framed glasses, giving him a scholarly appearance. Sayeloporo wears a long shirt that covers his entire torso up to the top of his neck. He has three stripes on his uniform, each starting at his collar with two running to each side of his chest and one down the middle. He wears the regular pants with a slight length taken away. He also wears white gloves. Technically, you are correct, Sayeloporo, the goddess said, drawing looks from everyone else. Well, partly anyway. What does that mean? Sayeloporo asked. The goddess didn't say anything right away, and instead, she was looking down toward Naruto, who was just impaled through the heart by Sasuke's Chidori. They were all listening, as with his dying breath, Naruto said to Sasuke that Sasuke is a traitor, how he is not his best friend, he never was and never will be, and how killing him will not give Sasuke, Mangekyo Sharingan, like Sasuke and most of the villagers were hoping. The goddess and the others watched, as Naruto died, and then his soul left his body, before a small red orb separated from Naruto's soul and disappeared. This surprised everyone but the goddess, as she knew what that was. What happened next though, surprised them even more. Naruto's soul glowed black, before it split up in ten different orbs, each different colored, which then flew toward the sky until, one after the other, they all disappeared. Another interesting thing that happened, was that the necklace Naruto had around his neck, the same one Sunid gave him, broke into ten different pieces, and they also disappeared. Once Naruto's soul disappeared, the goddess snapped her fingers, and Kanoa disappeared from everyone's sights, turning the floor below them all, the same white color as the walls and the ceiling. As you have heard, the boy's name, was Naruto Uzumaki, the goddess said, and then went to explain about the boy's life, from the night of his birth, until the day of his death. The red orb which separated from his soul, was Nine Tails soul, which will eventually reappear somewhere in the elemental nations. What happened afterward, is that Naruto's soul, broke into ten pieces. Each piece ended up in Hyuko Mundo, where they became hollows. Over time, those ten pieces would rise in power and rank, with one of the pieces, actually splitting once more, the goddess noticed that it has finally started to dawn, where she was going with this explanation, on the minds of the beings in front of her. Those ten pieces, would become the eleven of you, after Stark over there, split his soul once again to create Lilinette. The silence which followed after it was revealed that Espada all used to be one human boy, before his death and the break of his soul, was unnatural. It was quitter then on the cemetery during the night. Eventually, it was broken by Sayeloporo. But how is that possible, he asked. Human souls can't break into pieces like that. At least not naturally. Instead of answering the question right away, the goddess went and snapped her fingers one more time, before the eyes of the Arankars glowed and then glazed over for few moments. What was that? Asked a tall, muscular man with light blue spiky hair and light blue eyes, the latter including green lines below them. His name is Grimjo. Grimjo's attire consists of a white hakama, a black sash and a ragged white jacket with an upturned collar. The inner lining of his jacket is black and Grimjo wears it with the sleeves rolled up and leaving it open to expose his muscular chest. The remains of his hollow mask consist of the right jawbone and his hollow hole is located on his abdomen. Grimjo sports a large scar across his torso, gained from his battle with Ichigo Kurosaki. The other Arankar wondered the same, though smarter ones, like Sayeloporo, seemed to have figured it out. Those were Naruto's memories from when he was alive, the goddess said. After he died and his soul broke, all the memories of his life were buried deep into all of your minds. I just brought them out. Do you now understand why Naruto's soul broke? The goddess asked. 
Do you understand the kind of life he had is what caused his soul to crack when he was still alive, until it finally shattered when he died. So Yeliporo is right. Souls shouldn't shatter like that without something powerful causing it to break. Pain and suffering Naruto felt and experienced during his short life, were powerful enough to break his soul, and over time, create all of you. All of you represent something about him. His feelings, his experiences, his desires, his, aspects. All of your powers, are dependent on how powerful his aspects were. Seeing the confused looks, the goddess decided to explain. For example, Yami. The goddess looked toward Yami Argo. He is by far the largest of the current Espada, Yami is a giant Arankar with tan skin, a powerful build, and a ridge-lined cranium. He has brown eyes, black hair, long, bushy sideburns, and a thin ponytail reaching his upper back. Aside from this, he is bald. He has orange eyebrows, and red markings under his eyes. He wears the standard Espada uniform, with the only difference being his jacket is always open. Like all Arankar, he has a large hole signifying his previous time as a hollow, his is located in the center of his chest. What remains of his hollow mask is the jawbone, complete with eight teeth, which rests on his chin. A tattoo of the number 10, signifying Yami's rank, is on his left shoulder. In his released form, the one melts away, leaving just the zero. Yami looked toward the goddess, waiting to see what she will say about him. You are the strongest of all ten of you, and your aspect is rage, the goddess said. That's because of all of Naruto's aspects, his rage was the strongest. It even eclipsed his loneliness, which became Stark's aspect of solitude. The same goes for the rest of you, she was now looking at everyone, and not just at Yami. The more powerful one of his emotions was, the more powerful you became as representation of those emotions, representation of Naruto's aspects. The goddess paused, and had a thoughtful look for a moment, while looking at Barragan, Alkiora, and Zomari. Barragan has the appearance of an elderly man, with a left olive green eye, a white moustache and white hair. His face is lined by large scars on the left side of his chin that goes down to his neck and across his right eye. Despite his aged appearance, Barragan is quite stocky and muscular, and when standing, albeit with the slouch of an elderly person, he is of a fair size. He wears a regal white leather coat with black fur lining, short sleeves, and three black fur stripes running along the bottom. He wears a golden wristband on both wrists, and a belt consisting of three thick chains attached to a large metal disc with a sun emblem. Overall, he resembles a barbarian lord, of Viking origin. The remnants of his hollow mask take the form of a five-pointed crown just above his forehead. The location of his espada tattoo is unknown. His hollow hole is in the center of his chest. Zomari is a tall, muscular, dark-skinned Arankar with noticeably large lips. The remnants of his hollow mask consist of a row of bony spikes along the crest of his head, forming something similar to a mohawk hairstyle along with a pair of skull-shaped earrings and a thick bony necklace, however, it is uncertain if the necklace may also be a part of his hollow remains. This gives him somewhat of a witch-doctor appearance. He is also bald and has golden-yellow eyes. Zomari's uniform conceals his espada tattoo and consists of a long mandarin-style Arankar jacket with a small opening at his chest area. He wears a default hakama like all other Arankar, although his sandals resemble traditional martial arts training shoes. Zomari has three triangle-shaped tattoos on his chin. He also has four lines running down from his forehead directly above his eyes that end with dots appearing as exclamation points. These are on both sides of his head, giving him a total of eight lines. The three represent senescence, nihilism and hedonism, in that order, and that is what's confusing the goddess. Naruto was 12 years old when he died, the goddess said. So the reason behind one of the pieces of his soul becoming Barragan, or why it represents senescence, is beyond me. Alkiora's nihilism, maybe I can understand to a certain point why some of his beliefs can be considered nihilistic. I don't understand Zomari's aspect at all, she outright said. Nothing. Absolutely nothing about Naruto would make me think that he has even a whiff of hedonism in him. It just, doesn't go with him just like senescence. Everyone thought about what the goddess said, while casting occasional looks at Barragan, Alkiora and Zomari, but since none of them could think of an answer to the goddess's doubts, they decided to let it go for now. There was one question on everyone's minds at that point, and the one who finally asked it, was Tyr Haribel. Haribel is a tall female Arankar with olive skin, aqua green eyes, thick eyelashes, and short golden blonde hair. 
which she usually keeps messy with three braided locks. She wears a variation of the Arankar jacket with a high collar, which covers the lower part of her face downward, while bearing a good portion of the lower half of her large breasts. The jacket has a zipper running along its entire length, which is open from the bottom upwards. It has a beige air filter on either side just below the trim. The jacket's sleeves completely envelop her arms, terminating in black glove-like extensions at her extremities, resembling the appearance of a cat's paw. The remnants of her hollow mask consist of the sides of her face, her mouth, and an extensive area below and around her neck extending down to, and also covering, her nipples. She usually hides these remnants from view with her jacket. Her espada tattoo is placed on the left side of her right breast. The location of her hollow hole is in her lower abdomen where her womb would be. What happens, now, Harabel asked. What is the real reason you brought us all here after our deaths? The goddess noticed that everyone's eyes were now on her, so she smiled, and said. I brought you all here because I'm going to fuse you all back together and recreate the original Naruto Uzumaki. Once she said that, several Arankars, who were more open about showing their emotions and facial expressions, like Yami, Lilinette and Grimjo, had their jaws on the floor, while several others had their eyes wide open. The only thing noticeable on the faces of Alkiora, Barragan and Stark, are raised eyebrows. Is that even possible? Asked the weakest piece of Naruto's soul. Aroniero Araruere's face is usually concealed behind an elongated, white mask covered with eight holes. He dons this while in the light and also while around his fellow Espada, as he has grown weary of questions and offhand remarks regarding his appearance. Right now though, he was without the mask, so everyone could see his real looks, which are, disturbing, to say the least. In place of a normal head, he has a large, cylindrical glass capsule filled with red liquid, with two small hollow heads suspended within its confines. The two heads are both tattooed with the number 9 and tend to talk in tandem when revealed, giving the effect of two people speaking in turn. The upper head speaks with a deep voice, while the other speaks in a high-pitched, childlike voice. Each head appears to have its own level of individuality. His outfit, like that of most Espada, is customized, he wears a dress garb that covers his entire body as opposed to the normal jacket and hakama. He also wears a frilly noble's coat that acts as his replacement jacket and a single white gentleman's glove. The remains of his hollow mask are on both of his heads, the upper head having three quarters of itself covered with the mask, and the lower head having only half of itself covered. His hollow hole is located in the left thigh area. I'm a goddess, a goddess said. I can do almost anything. Fusing you all back to how you used to be before the split, is easier than you think. And why would you do that, Harabel asked. Why just not let us disappear now that we are dead? The goddess sighed. Naruto didn't deserve to die when he did, she said. He has a big destiny, and allowing him to die, was a big blunder on my part. You may think that I'm all-powerful, and to a certain extent, I am. Of course, there is a limit to everything, and some things, even I can't do, or I'm not allowed by the universal laws. I knew the kind of life Naruto had since he was born, and I kept an eye on him, because I knew that there would be those who wish his death. I spent 12 years looking over him, keeping him alive in several cases, but the one time I was occupied with something else, he was executed right away. By the time I found out, he was already dead, and I couldn't do anything, since his soul already broke and the pieces went to Hugo Mundo. I was so angry after that. I almost ended up destroying the elemental nations, and the only thing that stopped me were my siblings, who reminded me that I would be punished if I hurt mortals. At that point, the only option I was left with was to wait for all of you to die, so I can bring you here and fuse you back. Once the goddess finished, she looked at the faces of all the Arankars, and saw that most of them had angry looks on their faces, but few had curious looks. One of those with curious looks was Alkiora, who asked, Why is Naruto so important that you spent so much time guarding him, and now are going as far as to fuse us all to recreate him? Naruto is the child prophesied to either save or destroy the elemental nations, the goddess said, getting raised eyebrows from every Arankar. That's why he is so important, and why his death is something that should have never happened. Once a prophecy is made, no one is allowed to manipulate it and try to make it work how they want. The prophecy about Naruto was told to Naruto's former teacher, by his summons, and he told it to his own teacher, the third Hokage, who then decided they should keep quiet about it, which is a good thing. The bad thing is that they decided to manipulate the prophecy to work for them. 
They wanted Kanoa and the Land of Fire to be the strongest in the elemental nations, so they allowed Naruto to be starved, abused, both physically and mentally and many other things, while at the same time, the third Hokage played a grandfather figure in Naruto's life, making Naruto think he actually cared about him, when he didn't and only wanted Naruto forged into a weapon to send after everyone except Kanoa and the Land of Fire. Of course, they couldn't just train him to become strong, or let him have a normal life and do as he pleases, as they thought that he could become uncontrollable. Every time he was tortured, Hokage knew from the start, and even ordered some of the attacks. He would wait until Naruto is just about to be killed, or until he took enough damage that it would take a while even for the Nine Tails to heal, before he stopped the attack, and then took Naruto to the hospital. Then, he would play the concerned grandfather, who would tell Naruto that the villagers don't know what they are doing, and that he should learn to forgive and forget. He is the one who implanted the thought of becoming Hokage, in Naruto's head as he thought that if Naruto aspires to something like that, it would keep him loyal to the village and do everything in order to get recognition. The third, is also the one who allowed all the beatings, and who allowed the sabotage in the Ninja Academy. Naruto needed to be mentally held back, stupid and pliable, so that the day won't come, when he would start asking questions, the third didn't want answered. In the end, all of those tortures, mental and physical, mental manipulations, starvations, all of it, led to Naruto being considerably weaker than he should have been at the time of his death. But even with all of that, Naruto would have changed the elemental nations in one way or another, but with his death, the prophecy was left unfinished, which will lead to a complete destruction of the elemental nations. Do you all understand now, why it is important to recreate Naruto, and send him back to the elemental nations? The goddess asked in the end, after a lengthy explanation. A silence was what followed the question, and it lasted for a few minutes, with no one saying anything. They were all thinking about all the stuff they learned, and about the question. Eventually, Sayeloporo started to talk. You said that Naruto is prophesied to either, save or destroy the elemental nations, right, the goddess nodded. And now you say that if Naruto isn't sent back, the elemental nations would be destroyed. Another question and another nod, from the goddess. You do realize that after everything you just told us, there is no way that Naruto would save anybody, and would destroy the elemental nations with his bare hands, if he was sent back. Why send him at all, instead of just letting the damn place be destroyed and be done with it? The goddess sighed. Now that you have all of Naruto's memories and know that not even the third Hokage cared about him, as he thought, I can't blame you for wanting to destroy the EN, and be done with it, as you said. But you need to understand, that there are still people there who are innocent and who care about Naruto. Without Naruto, every leaving being on the EN, would perish, and that doesn't just mean, humans, but animals, insects, summoning animals, everything would die. If Naruto is sent back, and goes on a complete rampage, destroying everything in sight, there will still be survivors here and there, unlike what would happen without him there. With him, even if destroyed, the end could be rebuilt, without him, there would be no life left. Every Arankar wondered what could possibly cause the complete eradication of life in a place as big as the elemental nations, but they chose not to voice the question. Instead, they all thought about what should they do, and should they accept Goddess's proposal and fuse into Naruto, or should they refuse and just disappear forever. It didn't take them long to realize that whatever they chose, they will no longer exist as they did until then they will all disappear in one way or another. Eventually, they all came to the same decision. We accept. They all said at the same time. The goddess smiled at them. She was happy about the decision, not just because that decision is going to give Naruto another chance in life, but it will also save many lives. She frowned for a second, as she understood that even though many lives will be saved, about as many, if not even more, will be lost to newly reborn Naruto's, wrath. I just hope they don't kill too many people, the goddess thought. My sister will have a lot of job because of that, and I don't want to listen to her complaints. The goddess looked at all eleven Arankar, and said, I thank you for this decision, and I hope that once you are all joined together, you will have a happy life, something which was denied to you all so far. The others didn't say anything, thought a few nodded, and then watched as the goddess's eyes glowed, golden, and then they all started to glow, before, one after the other, they all turned into a golden light, which combined together to form a ball of golden energy. The situation in Kanoa hasn't been the best in the last three years, ever since the execution of Naruto Uzumaki. 
While the citizens of Kanoa mostly hate Naruto, and wanted his death ever since Nine Tails was sealed inside of him, the same can't be said for the people from the other nations, whose lives have been touched by Naruto, in one way or another. The citizens of countries like, Wave, Wind, and Spring, have all grown to like Naruto and respect him a lot for what he has done for them during his short life as Kanoa Shinobi, which is why they were not happy when they heard about Naruto's execution. No, they were pissed off as all hell. As such, it shouldn't have been a surprise to anyone, when they all broke off the alliances and trade agreements with Kanoa and the Land of Fire. For those in the Land of Fire and Kanoa, it was a shock to them when it happened. They didn't understand why it happened in the first, and when they found out that it was because of what they did to Naruto, they were confused at first, but then Kanoa residents, started cursing Naruto's name even more than they already did, as they thought that he is tormenting them even from hell, where they thought he is there, as they believe him to be a demon. They were confused, because Naruto was never mentioned in any reports, about helping anyone in any country. Instead, Kakashi, the third Hokage and the village elders were changing the reports, making it look like everything good that Naruto did for other villages, was in fact, done by Sasuke. So, all in all, the people of Kanoa, both civilians and ninja alike, think that Sasuke is the one who saved Wave Country from Gato, that he is the one who defeated Gara and saved the village when Gara released the One Tail, and finally, that Sasuke is the main reason behind Doto's defeat and the saving of Princess Kiyuki Kazahana. When the alliances were broken, it was revealed that they were broken because of what happened to Naruto, but the reason behind why all those villages and countries respect Naruto so much, was kept quiet by the higher-ups of Kanoa. They wanted everyone to believe that Sasuke is the one who saved those countries, while Naruto had nothing to do that, and because of that, Kanoa and the Land of Fire have been slowly degrading over the years. At the time of Naruto's death, Kanoa was the strongest hidden village in the EN, while Land of Fire was the most prosperous country, but, after Naruto's death, and the broken alliances, the lack of money because of the decrease in missions, has caused Kanoa to fall down on the third place among the five great hidden villages, with Cloud and Stone being the first and second, and Sand and Mist fourth and fifth. Just like Kanoa who has suffered because of the lack of money as there were less and less missions as the time was passing, Land of Fire was suffering equally from the lack of trade and zero alliances, as everyone has turned the backs on him after the Fire Daimyo has been revealed to have supported Naruto's execution. It was not revealed why he allowed it, but he did, and just like those in Kanoa, he is now having problems coming up with the money to run the country. Several months after Naruto's execution, Soon had suffered a mental breakdown, and was sent to a mental institution, while Danzo has been named as the sixth Hokage. Danzo being made a Hokage, didn't help Kanoa one bit. Instead, it actually made things worse for them, because people from the other countries knew who he was, and what his wishes were, so they stayed away from Kanoa, but were preparing themselves in case of the invasion by Kanoa, which, knowing Danzo, wouldn't have surprised anyone. If Sunid has stayed the Hokage, the situation would still be bad, but maybe there would be some countries who would be willing to do something to help, since she is actually liked and respected all over the EN, even by Kanoa's enemies. The moment Sunid had a mental breakdown, was the moment the countdown to Kanoa's doom, has started. No one knows the reason behind Sunid's mental breakdown, but those who knew her and of her close, mother-son, relationship with Naruto, assumed it was because of what happened to him. To this day, three years after Naruto's execution, no one knows why Sunid went with it, and didn't try to stop the execution. In the minds of all of Kanoa's citizens, her blank face from when she was standing on top of the execution platform, was engraved forever. Many have theorized that she tried to stop the execution, but when the council and Daimyo overruled her, she snapped, and only was able to hold herself from going completely under, for a few months, before she finally broke completely. Unfortunately, they weren't sure if it was that, or was it something else, so they just decided to let it go, and learn to live with it. With Danzo as Hokage, he implemented his root program, and made the village more militarized than it was, which led to the other nations also increasing the military power. All of that increase in Shinobi in all five great nations, along with some smaller ones as well, turned the whole in into a giant bomb, just waiting to explode and send everything straight to hell. As the things are now, all five great nations, are standing alone, without alliance between two of them, like Leaf and Sand used to have alliance until three years ago. The fact that they are all standing alone, is the reason the great nations haven't started another war, as each country is afraid that if they attack one country, another might use the opportunity to attack them. 
Of course, none of the Great Five are just seating around. On top of them increasing their military potential, by increasing the number of ninja as well as train those they already have to reach their maximal potential, they are also trying to make alliances with smaller countries. That wasn't going easy, though, because there is mistrust between everyone in the EN, and no country trust another enough to form alliances, but there are a few exceptions, where alliances are formed not based on trust, but mutual need. One such alliance is between Stone and Sound, where 3rd Suchikij and Orokimaru have formed alliance in order to build power together and eventually bring down Cloud and Kanoa, and then go after the rest of the N. The only alliance which was built in the last three years, and which didn't have anything with building military power, was the alliance between Sand, Wave and Spring. The alliance was built after they all severed their ties with Kanoa, because of what happened to Naruto. It was a respect they all for Naruto, which was a starting point for the meeting between the leaders of the three nations, which led to an alliance, which was supposed to better the life for everyone in each of the three countries, as each of them had something that the other two would want and find beneficial. Other than the two alliances, there were some negotiations between some other countries, but nothing was agreed on, as of yet. The closest to reach the agreement for the alliance, a rain village, star village, waterfall village and grass village, who are trying to form the alliance to battle against the big nations, in case they decide to use their land as the battleground like they did in the past. Rain, is secretly led by the Akatsuki, and that was revealed to the other three nations during the negotiations. The reason the leader of Akatsuki and the Rain, decided to reveal that, was so that the other three nations would realize how powerful Rain actually is, considering that they have 10s rank ninja in the village, which is more than any other village in the elemental nation. If, this alliance is made, then it would be the most powerful alliance of all others in the elemental nations, and nothing short of all five great hidden villages, allying, would be able to go up against them. To make themselves stronger, and to counter possible alliance between, rain, star, waterfall and grass, Orokimaru sent some of his men to the village hidden in the dreams, to require something, which would be powerful enough to make sound stone alliance, capable of battling against Akatsuki and the alliance of four nations. They were successful, and the three-headed guardian beast of the Hidden Dreams village, was sealed inside one of the members of the Uzumaki clan, Orokimaru had as a ninja in his village. The woman, by the name, Fuka Uzumaki, has officially become the first ever, three-heads Jinchuriki. To try and combat against the overwhelming power and forces, Rain and their allies, along with Sound Stone Alliance, Danzo has sent a team on a mission to retrieve another demon, who was sealed long time ago, and which would give them power to fight back, now that they no longer have nine tails Jinchuriki. Kanoa, three years after Naruto's execution, a team which was sent on a mission to capture and seal a demon known as, Mario, was Team 7. After Naruto's execution, the relationship between Team 7 members was not what one would expect. In the eyes of the many, Naruto was a menace at best, and a demon, at worst, and Kakashi and Sasuke had the same beliefs. In fact, in their eyes, Naruto's only use was to eventually be killed by Sasuke, so he can awaken Mangekyo Sharingan. Kakashi has been pushing the two to be friends, for that reason, as he knew that in order for him to awaken Mangekyo, Sasuke would have to kill his best friend, Naruto. To say they were pissed when Naruto said to Sasuke's face during the execution, that he was not his best friend, he didn't even consider him as a friend, for that matter, thus, denying Sasuke his Mangekyo Sharingan. Since he was denied what he considers his birthright, Sasuke become an even bigger emo than he was, going all over Kanoa, demanding everyone he sees and who has some form of power and influence, to train him so he can become strong, and maybe one day find another way to awaken his Mangekyo. Of course, like a good little doggy, Kakashi was following Sasuke everywhere and was spending 90% of his free time training Sasuke, while he spends the remaining 10% of his free time, trying to convince other Kanoa ninja to also train Sasuke. Kakashi wasn't always successful in his endeavors, though. This was because, while regular, no-named ninja, would agree to train Sasuke, they have nothing to offer, which Kakashi doesn't already know and can teach Sasuke himself. On the other hand, those more powerful ninja in the village, like Asuma, Gai and Kurenai, refuse to have anything with Sasuke, or Kakashi, since they don't like them and consider Sasuke a traitor and comrade killer. They were too smart to believe that Sasuke was kidnapped by Orokimaru's man, and know that the little bastard, left on his own accord. The three of them were also some of the people in Kanoa who had respect for Naruto, and didn't hate him. 
In the end, Sasuke was left with only Kakashi and Danzo to train him. Danzo did try to threaten Asuma, Ga and Kurenai to train Sasuke, or else. They still refused, though, and Danzo couldn't do anything about it, even though he was Hokage. He knew that those three are some of the strongest ninja in the village, along with Kakashi, Jiraiya and himself, so losing them just because they refused to train Sasuke, was not an option. While Kakashi and Sasuke were on one side, and always together, training, Sakura was left behind. To find a way to train herself. Before Naruto's execution, she was planning to ask Suna to take her as her own apprentice and teach her medical ninjutsu. Unfortunately, that all went to hell when Naruto was accused of almost killing Sasuke, and executed, after which, Suna was never the same as before, and soon after she had a mental breakdown, which gave her one-way ticket to asylum. When it comes to what happened to Naruto, Sakura had mixed feelings. She never really liked Naruto, some even though she hated him because of how she treated him over the years, and how many times she hit him over the head. But, they were all wrong. Sakura didn't like Naruto, but she didn't hate him either. She was annoyed by him, and thought he was always on the way of her relationship with Sasuke. When Naruto was accused and sentenced to execution, she was surprised, to say the least. She knew that Naruto wasn't liked in the village, but to go as far as to execute him, after he completed his mission, and returned Sasuke back to the village, even though he did beat him up pretty badly, well, she thought that was too much, and that Naruto didn't deserve that. She had mixed feeling, because, while she found Naruto annoying and if he was executed, there would be no one standing in between her and Sasuke, she also didn't want to watch Naruto die. In the end, those mixed feelings, along with Kakashi and Sasuke not paying any attention to her, whatsoever, is what strained their team relationship, and eventually led to Sakura going on one side, while Kakashi and Sasuke on the other. They were still members of Team 7, though, and went together on the missions, but outside of the missions, Sakura barely saw her crush, well, more like former crush, and her sensei. Sometime after Naruto's death, and after Danzo became Hokage, he had one of his root agents transferred into Team 7, to replace Naruto, so they can be a full team, once again. And while Kakashi and Sasuke didn't care about Sai, they did train with him, on Danzo's orders, of course. Sakura didn't like the guy from the first time she laid her eyes on him, and saw his fake smile. She thinks that he is even worse than Naruto, as impossible as that might be. With Naruto, she knew that even though she found him annoying, he would always be there and do anything to protect his comrades, while Sai, is an emotionless tool, who comes up with ridiculous and offensive nicknames for people, which is why no one really likes him. On top of that, Sakura feels that Sai would let her die before he tries to save her, while Naruto would risk his life to save, not only her, but all those he thinks of as his friends and comrades. Because Sunad was unavailable, Sakura ended up convincing Shizun, to help her with her training and to learn medical jutsu. Shizun didn't have Sunad's chakra enhanced strength, so she couldn't teach that to Sakura, but something is better than nothing, and Sakura knew that if she doesn't train with Shizun and with some of the other medics in the hospital, she would be left behind, and the only thing left for her, would be to give up on the life of Kanoiki and go back to being a civilian, and that is something she didn't want to. Team 7 was currently standing in the Hokage office, in front of Danzo, who was seating behind his desk, and was looking at them with one eye, since his other was covered by bandages. On the couch, which was to the side of the office, the two village elders, Homura and Koharu, were seating and waiting to hear the report from Team 7, about the mission they were sent on. Danzo looked at the four ninja in front of him, and frowned at the looks on their faces. While Sasuke wore a scowl, like he always does, it was the expressions on the faces of the other three, that suggested to him that the mission didn't exactly go as planned and wanted. Sai's facial expression was blank, which was unusual to Danzo, because Sai has started to wear that infuriating fake smile ever since he was transferred from Root Program, to Team 7. Sakura was trying to normal, but Danzo could see she was nervous, but there was also a hint of curiosity to her face. Kakashi wasn't reading his perverted book, and was almost standing at attention. Danzo could also see that he was nervous, but also slightly scared, though if Danzo had to guess, Kakashi wasn't scared of him, but from something related to the mission he just came back from. Danzo finally decided to stop guessing, and said, Report. Kakashi walked in front of his students, before he coughed and said, The mission to retrieve and seal Mario was, a failure.
With the golden shine in her eyes, the goddess has turned all ten espada, plus lilinet, into a pure golden energy, which then started to fuse together, forming a golden ball. At first, the ball was quite big, being several meters in diameter, but as the minutes passed, the ball was shrinking in size, while at the same time, was apparently increasing its density, considering that the floor below the ball was cracking from the pressure. Along with the shrinking of the ball, there were also sparks of electricity rolling over the ball. All in all, the picture looks and feels quite scary, and would have made every human and low-class deity, shiver in fear from the ominous feeling the ball was exuding. Once the ball was down to about 2 meters in diameter, it stopped shrinking, but the electricity around grew more powerful, while at the same time, cracks started to appear all over the ball. While this was happening, the goddess was calmly standing few meters away from the ball, and looking at it, waiting for the fusion to finish, so that she can see what will come out, as even she is unsure how Naruto will look like after the fusion. One thing she knows for sure, though, is that he will be looking at least slightly different than he used to be, before his death. It took five minutes for the fusion to be over, and once it was, the ball of golden energy burst into golden light, leaving behind a being of incredible power. The goddess cast a look at the new Naruto, and couldn't help herself as he gained a small red hue on her cheeks. Newly reborn Naruto is a tall, muscular man with light blonde spiky hair and dark blue eyes. He is around 190 centimeters tall, and about 90 kilograms. He wears a black shirt which he keeps partially unzipped around his chest area, along with black pants, black boots and two white belts around his waist, with his zanpakuto sheathed on his left side along his top belt, while on both sides of his lower belt, he has two gun holsters, with two guns in them. He wears white jacket, the same kind as the one worn by Grimjo. He has a Van Dyke style beard, and, unlike the original Naruto, he no longer has whisker marks on his cheeks, but instead, has two black lines on his cheeks, with the top line, being the shortest, is connected to the black pigments around his eyes. Finally, while at that time, Naruto should be around 15 or 16 years old, this new Naruto looks to be around 20 years old. Basically, it's a combination of Grimjo's hairstyle and attire from 1000 Years Blood War, along with Naruto's Berean mode face markings, except fox ears and the pigments around his eyes don't go upward, and are only around his eyes and below. Naruto looked at himself as much as he could, without a mirror, and whistled. Damn. I really look good, don't I? And this power I feel. It's, incredible. The goddess smiled when she saw Naruto's reaction, and said. Well, you're a combination of ten espada. Of course you are powerful. I'd say that right now, you're about as powerful as, Aizen was, after he completely fused with Hogyoku. Really? Naruto questioned as he looked at the goddess, who nodded in confirmation. Yes, which means, that at your current power, you could be considered a third most powerful being in your old world. Aizen is your equal, while the two more powerful ones are, Achigo Kurosaki, in his transcended form, and the founder of Quincy. Naruto was surprised by this. Especially because Achigo wasn't that powerful the last time one of his espada forms saw him, which was when Zaraki and Bayakuya showed up to take on Yami. This suggested to him that more time has passed since the death of Espada and their appearance in the heavenly realm, than he though. How much time has passed since the death of Espada and their appearance here? Naruto asked. Quite a bit, actually, the goddess said. Time passes differently in between different dimensions. For you, it has been many millennia since the death of the original Naruto, but in your old world, only three years has passed. It's the same with this realm. It's been about two years since the death of all Espada, and since then, many things have happened in that world, starting with Aizen's defeat at the hands of Ichigo Kurosaki and Kisuke Urahara, and his imprisonment after that. But never mind that now, since that world is no longer important to you, as you are not going back there. Naruto listened to what the goddess was saying and couldn't help himself but show a large grin on his face. He was unbelievably happy because of what happened to Aizen. It's probably because of how much some of his previous forms, like Baragan, for example, hated the damned Shinigami. Then again, Alkiora did respect Aizen, along with some others, but majority of the Ten Espada, hated Aizen. The goddess saw the grin on Naruto's face, and smiled a little, while also shaking her head. Before I send you back, there is one other thing I must tell you. This drew Naruto's attention, so he was all ears. I will be sending you back into your old world, the goddess said, but Naruto already knew that. 
Instead of interrupting her with a question, he waited to hear what else she has to say. But I will also be sending you back in time. You will appear in that world, on the same day of Naruto's execution, though you will not appear in Kanoa, but somewhere else. Naruto looked at her with a confused look on her face. Why? I'm assuming you mean, why am I sending you back in time, instead of just sending you at the current time? The goddess questioned, and Naruto nodded. That's because I'm hoping that you will actually save the end from total destruction, and sending you back, will give you more time to do that, and save some people who didn't deserve to die. Naruto looked at the goddess with narrowed eyes for a little while, before he shook his head. Do as you wish, but I wouldn't get my hopes to high. I hate nearly every human being in the EN, and I doubt I'll do much to save them. You say that now, the goddess said with a slight smile on her face. But when you find yourself in a situation where you have to choose between saving an innocent life, or watching them die, then your resolve will be truly tested and then you will see that you are not as cold-blooded and murderous as you might believe. Naruto decided to change the subject and asked. Tell me about my powers. I feel different than I felt when I was human, but I also don't feel like a hollow, either. So what am I right now? The goddess thought about Naruto's question for a moment, before she said. Technically, you are a human, hollow hybrid. She saw a confused look on Naruto's face, so she explained better. As you have probably noticed by now, you no longer have a hollow hole, nor the remnants of the hollow mask, Naruto nodded. That means that you are not a pure hollow. You are more like a Chigo Kurosaki and the other Visereds, yet still not the same, since they are Shinigami and human, with hollow infection. You are a human with inherited hollow power. Naruto thought about it for a minute, before it came to him. So, basically, I'm like a product of one parent being human, and the other a pure hollow. The goddess nodded with a smile. That's the best way to explain it. Naruto looked at his hands for a few moments, and then asked. So which powers do I have? I can feel bother Chakra and Rerioku, but which of the powers I had as Espada, do I still have? The goddess shrugged. Pretty much all of them except Resurrection. You are not a full Arankar class hollow, but a hybrid, which means you don't have Resurrection. On top of that, you have your full power at your disposal, with none of it sealed inside of the sword or anywhere else, which means there is no need for a Resurrection. Of course, you can power up, by releasing more of your Rerioku. Naruto rose his eyebrows in confusion, before he cast a look at his sword, which reminded him too much of Ichigo's Bankai sword, though different colored and was inside of a sheath. He also cast a look at the two pistols. Then what's up with these weapons? Where did they come from and why do I have them? Remember when I was showing you the day of your execution, the goddess questioned, and Naruto scowled, as he was reminded of that. He didn't answer, but the goddess knew he remembered, so she continued. You saw how after you soul broke, the necklace which Sunid gave you also broke into ten pieces, Naruto nodded, as he remembered seeing that as well, though he didn't know why that happened. Well, the necklace broke into ten pieces, just like your soul, and those pieces basically joined with pieces of your soul. Over time, they would become Zanpakutos, each espada was carrying. Naruto's eyes widened. You mean to tell me, that the weapons Espada were using for so long, were made out of a pieces of a, necklace. The goddess nodded. That necklace meant a lot to you, just like soon it did. Even though you didn't have it for too long, there was still a bond, which is why the necklace broke after your death, and the pieces tied themselves with your soul pieces. Naruto shook his head. This is getting ridiculous, and really hard to believe, he said. It might be a little bit hard to believe, the goddess said. But it's the truth. But anyway, now that you are fused back together, all the weapons Espada had, fused as well, but not into a necklace or into one weapon, but instead, into two different weapons. A sword, made out of five pieces of the necklace, and the two sibling guns, made from the other five pieces. The reason they became a sword and a gun, is because all of the Espada were using swords, before they go into resurrection. It is something in common with all of them, which means that of all the weapons it could have turned into, you have the most experience with swords, unlike with, scythes and axes, which were only used by two parts of your soul. The guns were also only used by Stark, but he was the strongest of Espada, not counting Yami's resurrection form, so you have more skills with guns, than with scythe and axe. Do you understand now? She asked at the end of her explanation. Yes, I understand, Naruto said, while looking at his weapons. 
But why the sword looks like Ichigo Kurosaki's Bankai Blade, only white instead of black? Honestly, I have no idea, the goddess said, making Naruto face fault. How can you not know? Naruto asked. Weren't you the one who fused me and my weapons? Yes, she said. I did fuse you. But it wasn't me who decided which weapons you are to have, nor was I who decided what they will look like. Maybe the sword looks like that, because Espada who fought against Ichigo, found it to be interesting, so your subconscious made it like that. Naruto thought about it, and realized that it might be the case. Ichigo has fought more Espada than anyone else, and two Espada were defeated by him, so it is possible that those parts of him wanted to have a blade similar to the one they lost to. Naruto sighed. Now what? As I said, now I will send you back in time, to the same day you originally died, but to a place a little away from Kanoa. The goddess said. Why that particular place? Naruto asked. Wherever it is. There is someone there, who will die, unless you save her, the goddess said, and Naruto groaned. Again with this saving stuff, he said, while shaking his head. Naruto then looked at the goddess and asked. Why do you want me to save this person? Because she is your family. The goddess said, and Naruto's eyes went wide in disbelief. The original you always wanted a family, and while you are very different now than you were back then, I know that deep down, you still want family and someone to be there for you, and not always be alone. Naruto was quiet. He was standing there in the heavenly realm, thinking about everything he heard from the goddess ever since she brought Espada to her realm, and everything he learned after she fused them all to recreate him. It is clear to him that she wants him to save the end that much is obvious, otherwise, she wouldn't have even bothered to recreate him and send him back. Now, while he is thankful that the goddess was giving him a new chance in life, Naruto couldn't just let go of everything that he has been through while he was living in the end. All the loneliness, pain, suffering. It was too much, and he wants revenge, but the goddess wants him to save those fools who live in the end. So basically, Naruto doesn't know what to do, especially now, that he knows that he has at least one member of his family still alive, and that, whoever she is, will die, unless he saves her. Naruto groaned and thought in his head. Fuck. XXX. Naruto's Zanpakuto looks exactly like Ichigo's in complete tensor Zangatsu, only pure white, instead of pure black. As for the guns, they are Stark's guns from Bleach Brave Souls. Stark has a Hogyoku empowered resurrection form there, just like all the other Espada, and the guns are based on those guns. Swords and guns are the only weapons Naruto will be using, even though he knows how to use sides and axes as well. Finally, imagine that Naruto in this story is voiced by DC Douglas, as I find his original English dub voice to be annoying, especially since it's female voice. That will be it for this video if you want more comment down below, like, subscribe. And see you guys later.